Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I just want to do, uh, I know I posted this and I sent out an email to everybody with reference to this Excel spreadsheet. But this spreadsheet that we created was to help you in chapter 11. And as you can see, everything that's in green on the spreadsheet, if you were to change those, then you would uh, hopefully be able to come very close uh, to aid you in answering the homework and in the um, quiz questions. So the first two example here on this 11-1 and two examples, the first two examples we created is for expected frequencies that are equal. So what does that really look like? So let's look at this first one here. This is one of the one of the homework questions that you may have to respond to most that. And this particular one here is looking at the professor wishes to, to understand the time preference, to show a time preference. A sample of the four statistics at the alpha 0 0.01 level. Do the students show a time preference? So when you look at that, <clears throat> in lieu of any other proportions that are given, that one would be considered an equal. Uh, expected frequencies are equal or similar. And with that, you should be able to either use this template or very quickly be able, hopefully quickly, be able to do it right from your textbook uh, following those examples. So let me show you what I mean. So I'm just gonna use these numbers. Let's say that the expected frequencies was 23, 33, 42, and 28. So as we can see <clears throat> that it calculated the, uh, it automatically calculated for me the expected frequency because it is, it's the sum of all the frequencies divided by four. These are individual calculations of that column, this column, this column, and this is the summation of this row here. But what I want you to see is that it automatically calculated it for us. I still have to go make my claim, and in that particular case there, because they're asking, do the, do the professor show a preference, meaning that because they're asking, do they show a preference, then certainly you should recognize that the null hypothesis is always, there's no difference, or in this example, there would not be a preference. So it has to be the alternate hypothesis that would be a claim. We just don't know how much of a difference. So once you understand the alpha level, again, this one was a 0 0.01, uh, not 0 0.05. So we'd, we'd have to go to table G with a 0 0.01 and go find the correct uh, critical value that would be automatically populated here. And let's just say very quickly that that one had four it had four sample sizes to it. So I go to table G for alpha level of 0 0.01. Four minus one gives me the degrees of freedom of three. So that gives me a six, 6.251 critical value. And you see uh, it also automatically populates here. This value automatically populates here for us as well. So that's what I mean by once you create a template, what I've been saying a lot, but once you create a template, use your templates, and then all you have to do is modify your templates. So in this case, we know that the 8.21, in this particular example, this is not the same value that's in the home pro homework problem anyway, but just in this example, since the test value of 8.271 is greater than the critical value, then if the critical value separates the line between the critical reject region and the critical non-reject region, then our test value falls to the right of our critical in the reject region. So in this particular example, we would reject the null hypothesis. And in, in fact, because we are rejecting the null hypothesis, there's not, there, there is enough evidence to support the claim that there is a preference, a difference in preference. And then if I had to come in here, let's say this one has got uh, five, but let's say if I had one for three, then all I'd have to do is strip out what I didn't need and certainly change this because I'm summing up four, change this, 
and also um, I would have to take out one of the columns here in my calculation of expected me, uh, observed minus expected squared divided by the, the expected. So you can see it's kind of modifiable, so to speak. So that first one was a good example of one that would be equal. Uh, let's see if we can find a few more here. Um, let's see what this one is going to look like. Okay, as we look at this one, this one's looking at apparently hospital patients and they have the, the uh, blood type distribution of those in general population and the distribution for the general population and they give you by blood type the different percentages. Then they tell us we have a random sample of 50 and we find that 12 of the 50 have blood A, 7 have blood type B, 23 have blood type O, and 8 have blood type AB. And again, we're at the 0.10 alpha level. And it looks like as a result of this, we have one, two, three, four, four, uh, four variables. So again, our degrees of freedom is N minus one. So once we know the degrees of freedom, we should be able to go to the table, table G with that alpha level and find the correct critical value. And it looks like uh, a medical researcher wishes to see if they have the same blood type distribution. So with using the term the same blood type, then that kind of indicates to me that maybe that particular one there would be uh, the null hypothesis would end up being the claim. But let's go check that real quick here. Okay, we found the critical value. I'm sorry. Yeah, the null hypothesis in that case would be the same, using the word the same, uh, the same blood type. So that indicates to me that that null hypothesis would be the uh, claim for this particular example. So with that one, we would know that because we have the distribution of the population, that would not be equal distribution, so we would have to use the other formula, if you recall, of, of, uh, of the n times k, excuse <clears throat> me, n times the proportion, and in that case, we would not be the equal, it would be expected frequencies are not equal, are not equal similar examples. So we would probably use one of these. Again, this is four, this is three, we had three data points, and this one has four. So let me, as you can see here, when we come in here and stop, and again, the legends don't really mean anything other than to keep track of what you're doing. But let's just say that this one, now, as you can see, it automatically populates the expected for us it sums up the total of our sample size. And I know the other one said 50, but I'm trying to show to you how this you can use this to expedite your work. We can still go to the alpha level. We can still find the critical value. It automatically populates here for us as well. And in this case, we have a uh, critical, a test value of 50.145. So we know that we would reject the null hypothesis in this with these values here. But what I want you to see is that I am calculating the number of, of the proportions times my sample size, which gives me my expected. The proportions times my sample size give me the expected. And then whenever I come here and I look at how the formula is actually doing its calculation, you can see that I am using uh, the observed minus the expected divided by the expected. Or in other words, what's in cell address N4 minus N6 divided by N6. And I'm doing that through all four columns. And that's how we calculate this. But whenever you are doing one that does not have equal and you're doing one that is having to do the calculations, uh, this is a good model to follow as well. 
uh, this one is three variables and this one here is four variables. So hopefully that may help explain how you can use this model here to uh, aid you in your homework. And obviously, let's say for an example that they told us that type A was 0.24, uh, I would just do this. Type A is 0.24, type B is 0.28 or 28%, type O is 0 0.30, and type AB is 0.18%. So you can see how I come in here and I put in the right proportions, and I come in and I put in um, the number of patients. So let me see if I can make it kind of match so that we can uh, be talking about the same thing. So we should get 50. Yep, 50. So it automatically calculates the expected for me, automatically calculates the test value for me as well. So that's how you can use this particular uh, Excel model to help you in your homework. Now let's look at one more just because we can, then we'll jump down to 11.2, because 11.2, we kind of brushed on it in class, but we didn't go into it into a tremendous amount of detail. Here's the aviation. Uh, this particular one here, uh, let me pull this one over to the side just for a moment. Let me look at something else here. Um, let me get this. Get my screens right here. Come on, you can come. There you go. So, this particular one here, we have the flights, uh, and we've got on time and those type things <clears throat> being on time, whether they're not. So, here you're looking at obviously, you're going to be stating the claim um, or the null or the alternate hypothesis. Uh, you want to go ahead and state your claim. You want to find your critical value based on the number of sample sizes or the number of K, the number of sample sizes that we have. In this case, we've got one, two, three, four, four columns of data or four data points. So K, me, N minus one gives us the degrees of freedom of three. At the alpha level of 0 0.025, make sure you're in the right place in the table. Then you go to table G and you find your critical value. Then you have to calculate your test value. And in this particular example, because they give us the 200 flights, they are showing that the observed in this case, or at least it looks like to me in this case, the observed would be that there's 145 planes that's on time. There's 27 that were delayed because of um, the weather. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Let me back up. There were 145 planes that were on time. 27 that were delayed because of the weather. 27 delayed because of the weather. Then there was eight because of the National Aviation System delay. And then there was the rest that was remaining from, um, because of, of, I guess, just arriving late, I guess is a better way to look at that. So we have 145 that were on time, plus 27 that were delayed because of the weather, plus eight because of the National Aviation System delay, then the rest because of arriving late. Uh, equals 20. So the rest of them arriving late would equal 20. So when we when we put that into our model, that should automatically calculate that should help us calculate the observed. Excuse me, that should give us the observed. I'm sorry. But because this is saying that um, there is a percentage of time, which again is developed into a proportion, proportion of time. So this one also would be a not equal. So we would not use, um, we would use the not equal model. I'm sorry, we would not use the first one where the expected frequencies are equal. We would use the expected frequencies which are not equal. But what is key to doing this one is that 
we have to make sure that we connect this dot here on the proportion. So if we have the expected, excuse me, the observed frequencies of 145 that are observed based on what we have here, all this information down here is the observed, we got to use this information to calculate the expected. And because we have a sample of 200, of those 200 flights, 70.8 were on time. So in our proportion using our model, it would be 70.8 times 200 would give us the on time expected. And then the national arriving or system delay, the delays, I think they had 8.2% times 200 would give us that one. So you kind of see how that is going in that direction. Then it's just a matter of doing the rest of the math. So but be mindful of that because this is in a proportion as well. You would not be using the expected frequencies or equal model. You would use the expected frequencies or not equal model. And uh, again, because the headings are different, don't get hung up on the headings of what's in green, uh, excuse me, uh, of the headings here, because you can see I can take out any heading that I want and the model will still work. Uh, so just be mindful that uh, you want to make sure that you, as you, you can see, as we change values, how it automatically does all the calculations for you. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is this section on 11.3. 11.3, um, excuse me, 11.2, I'm sorry, 11.3 was the ANOVA, I'm sorry, 11.2. The 11.2 is where we talked about uh, with similar, excuse me, with the rows and columns. So I kind of created this model following the very same um, thing that you see in your textbook of row one, row two, column one, column two, column three, and column four. So I summed up each row and each column. So I can do that. And then after I got my, what uh, I think was the observed values, then I came over here in this column where I was actually doing the actual calculations. And the actual calculations then are coming from, as you can see here, where the information is pulling, it is pulling from the calculations into here. And this information here, as you can see how, let me do that again, I'm sorry. So I, I used my expected here to be able to get my percentages of each one of my, or my decimal points of each one of my columns so that I can use that to calculate my um, expected, what I expect to see in each row by column. So in row one, column one, we have an expected of 52. In row one, column two, I have expected of eight. In row one, Column three, I have an expected of 26 and so forth, all the way down the model. So I'm able to do this calculation in order to determine my test value, which is 2.324 in this particular example. And at 2.34, as you can see, how it's all being calculated out of all that. And at 2. 234 is also automatically populated right here. So it's coming, so we can also see that. Um, so as we see that, hopefully that helps uh, as you can use this particular model to do some of the 11.2. But let me, let me restate this one more time. Um, I followed what was in the textbook of doing the rows by column and totaled up each, each row, then totaled up each column. So that gave me the total. Then I had to find out, <clears throat> then I had to find the 
<coughs> my observed from my expected divided by my expected in order to be able to calculate the individual column values. Then it was just a summation of this column plus this column plus this one plus this one all the way through. As you can see here, the sum of all this table, which gives me the test values. So this is calculating the expected values, and this calculated the test value for us. So, and then once I have that, again, I have this pointing back to here so that I know exactly what my test value is. And it's just a matter of looking at my test value, comparing that to my critical value, then making my claim. But again, this is just one example. The number's a little bit different, but you should be able to hopefully have a better feel of how to use some of these models when you're doing this type of homework, as well as when you get ready to do the test. Or if you choose, you can certainly do it with the uh, calculator, just build you build you a model where all you can do is, and, and one way to do it certainly would be to create a um, kind of like a template in your X, in your calculator and, and put in the values that way. Uh, be mindful of using the, be mindful again of using the, um, the parentheses to make sure that you get the correct syntax because if you don't again it will give you a number hopefully that will help hopefully that will be helpful and if you need assistance please let me know